Ah, oh, hello. I'm John Tritton, and this is water. It's a wonderful substance, but irrelevant to this. No, it wasn't the origin of the substance water that intrigued me, but rather the origin of the word water itself. And so I wrote a paper on it. Now, I'm the first to admit that this was more of an amateur's compilation of 200 years of old research to make something that was truly fascinating, accessible, understandable, and something that people actually wanted to learn about. So I think you can understand why I didn't really want to charge people money for this. However, I still wanted to publish it somewhere, because hey, you know, that looks flashy. And so I compromised. And Water, Water Everywhere, The Origins and Spread of the Word Water was published to Amazon Kindle for the lowest possible price. I don't really consider that accessible enough, however, and thus for this video. But, due to certain agreements, this is not a direct reading. This is an indirect reading, with various additional facts and things that were cut from the main paper, and this intro tacked on haphazardly. But I've distracted myself. What was that about water? Language throughout history flows as it cuts channels through time. Each branch of its linguistic estuary becomes a new word or idea for a different culture. Changes send out ripples. When waves collide, one idea becomes many. Root words develop and change while meanings alter, and studying these alterations reveals much about the languages themselves. To trace these changes, herein lies a deep dive into the origins and spread of the word water. Perhaps the most interesting part of researching etymology, the origins of words, is discovering the fascinating web of related ideas and words spread across cultures. But I fear we're getting ahead of ourselves again. Where did water itself come from? Because similar words exist in the other Germanic languages. The Dutch word is water, and it's identical in all but pronunciation to English. On the other hand, the German word, Wasser, shows us a considerable linguistic change. Languages like English, German, Swedish, Norwegian, Dutch, Danish, etc., that we all call collectively Germanic, exist in a language family that shares a common origin and a common set of root words. By comparing these modern linguistic siblings, the parent is reconstructed. The children have developed along different paths, but we can compare them to find their shared starting point. The Proto-Germanic word for water can be reconstructed as water, the root of the equivalent to water in all Germanic languages, including English, water, and German, Wasser. Now finding out how water became water isn't complex, but that's why we're starting with it. Before we can find out how words are connected, we need to know how they changed. To become English, the aspect of the vowels changed. You can see almost intuitively how water became water. The emphasis shifted to the front syllable, and the first vowel was lengthened, and that long O lost its significance. It went through very minimal change to become water. On the other side of the family, however, the Germans underwent a consonant shift. That is to say, many consonants in the emerging German language changed from one consonant to another. In this case, many became more fricative. That's when they become softer, more sonorous, and dependent on the tongue's friction with the point of articulation. To give the relevant example, the hard T of water shifted into the softer S of Wasser. This might sound unintuitive at first. How can a T just become a S? But acting it out yourself, you can begin to understand, so... Go ahead, I encourage you to try. Make that t, t sound. You can feel it as the tongue touches against the roof of the mouth. And now make a s, 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 a soft s. 
you can see how it's almost like evolution, stages between them we can imagine happening. That s doesn't make the contact the way that the T does. It grazes the surface, that point of articulation at the top of your mouth, without making contact. It's become fricative. And it's almost in, I would liken it to slurring the sound. The T becomes a S. A similar but more stereotypical process occurred when, in German, their letter W's W sound morphed into a V. This is a pretty common rule throughout most German dialects, and it's probably one of the most well-known changes between two languages. To put it to you simply, the visit with the German accents is, especially when it's as lowbrow as that, particularly defined by the well-known fact that, well, Germans pronounce W's as V's, to our English ears at least. And from there, the math adds up. And we can see how in these few steps, Vasa and water share that common origin at Wator. Even among these deeply related languages, small changes of dialects, phonemes, and pronunciations create different words. Imagine if they were given thousands of years to compound these changes separately. Before we dredge further into this pool of knowledge, it's important to understand language families. Because while we talk about them as siblings and a parent, they're not quite families in the way that we would expect. For instance, as you note, there is only one parent. In fact, in terms of families, they're more like a bacterium, splitting itself in half. Nobody speaks Proto-Germanic anymore, because they all developed into their own unique groups. This group speaks German, this group speaks English, this group speaks Dutch, and all the other Germanic languages. The groups have split, and in most cases, that parent language is no more, but its lineage and its root words are carried on. So let's get back to the hunt for the origin of water. The Germanic, Baltic, Slavic, Romance, Indo-Iranian, and over half a dozen other language families scattered across Eurasia have been traced back to a common ancestor called the Indo-Europeans. The Indo-European people are believed to have lived around the northern Black Sea or Caucasus Mountains upwards of 5,000 years ago, and their reconstructed language is known as Proto-Indo-European, or PIE. To demonstrate the connection here, the reconstructed Proto-Indo-European word for water is Wedor. Recall that the Proto-Germanic, which gave rise to the English word, is Wator. Now the difference between these two is primarily a consonant shift. As you can see, that D becomes a T once it's entering the Germanic language family. Now this change follows what is called Grimm's Law, an etymological rule which explains one of the unique attributes of the Germanic language family when compared to the other Indo-European language families that they are related to. The Germanic languages consistently swap out one set of consonants for another. Grimm's Law is a benchmark in etymological studies and will prove quite beneficial as we continue our expedition here. It was indeed standardized by one of the two brothers Grimm, famous for collecting their German fairy tales, but they were also quite influential linguists trying to promote a unified German culture in the early 1800s. The brothers Grimm spent much of their life's work working on issues such as this, the connection between Germanic languages and other European languages, as well as attempting to compile the first exhaustive dictionary for the German language. But Grimm's Law stands as one of their outstanding scientific achievements. Grimm found that where other languages across Europe possessed a voiced consonant in a word, the Germanic languages had a voiceless counterpart 
in their word for it. The difference between voiced and voiceless consonants is that voice consonants are produced by vibrating vocal cords, such as da, da, da. You can feel that yourself if you wish by placing your hand over your throat here as you say da, da, da. You can feel the vibrations going through. Conversely, voiceless consonants have no such vibrations, such as t, 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 t. If you recreate that sound, and once again putting your hand over your throat, you can feel that there is no such vibrations produced within your chords. It is voiceless. And this is the case we're dealing with, with Wedor, the Indo-European, and Wator, the Germanic. You can see that that D has become a T in Germanic languages. There are several other such substitutions, such as a P in other European languages will become an F in Germanic ones, or a T becomes a TH. To give a well-known example of this, then, uh, the Latin word for father is pater, you can see that the difference is Latin has a P, where English has an F, and Latin has a T, where English has a TH. But if you correct these substitutions, they are quite similar words, because they both emerge from the same Indo-European origins. Grimm's Law serves as quite a, a necessary cipher to understanding the linguistic changes that have set apart the Germanic languages, what makes it the Germanic language family instead of a part of the other Indo-European language families. Well, back to the old Indo-Europeans. The Proto-Indo-European word Wedor is not the end of our hunt for the source of water. Wedor is only the collective form of the Proto-Indo-European word Wodor. This is the unconjugated form, then, of their noun for water. In fact, we can trace this back one step further to find that the root concept for water, the starting point from which all other Indo-European words for water expand upon and emerge from, is simply wed. That suffix of the R, with the little circle beneath it, that was added to make water, conjugated that base word of wed into a noun. Whereas the next etymological rule we'll discuss, the Indo-European ablaut, explains why that vowel changed to make it a noun, as well as explaining the valid change between water and wedor. The first thing to explain about the Indo-European ablaut is simply what an ablaut is. It's a word only used in this field of linguistics, and an ablaut system simply replaces a vowel within a word as that word changes its grammatical form. It's not very common in English because English doesn't conjugate very many words. However, we can still see this case of an ablaut existing in words like sing, sang, the I changes to an A, the vowel changes, and the tense has shifted from present to past tense. Or another example is run to ran. The change in vowel tells you, as a listener, that this is a different tense that you must interpret, and that is the ablaut. Vowels are changed, and that changes the tense. Basically, all of the cases where we still have uh, things like this in English with sing to sang or run to ran and other ablaut cases are the cases that have been passed down straight from the Indo-Europeans without major changes made in the developmental path from back then to now. To use an example, then, we can see how as the tense changes from wed to the noun water, the vowel changes from that E sound to the O sound. That is the ablaut. It has changed its tense, and the vowel is changed. But 
complexities of ancient reconstructed languages aside, we have found what is generally accepted today as the oldest origin of the English word water. But before we continue, I'll put a question to you. We have found wed, this great root, but how exactly do we know that it's the oldest that we can discern? And the answer to that is simple, in that we don't. In these sorts of fields, you can never be fully certain. We can't even be fully certain that wet itself was used. It's a reconstructed root. It is the missing point that everything else in this video connects back to. And therefore, we say with certainty that it must have been the word and the root used by these Indo-Europeans. But that is a major issue, because when inspecting languages and roots as ancient as these, it becomes a serious labor to determine all of their descendants and relatives. For instance, we're talking here about the Indo-European language families. But the Uralic language family, which would give rise to modern-day languages like Finnish, Hungarian, and some local Siberian languages, well, the Proto-Uralic root for water is Weta. Now, anyone would have to admit that that's a striking similarity to the Proto-Indo-European Wed, but Proto-Uralic languages and Proto-Indo-European the two language families are geographically close contemporaries, but they're not seen as likely to be related by the majority of linguists. There's no wider connection between the two. There is just this one noteworthy similarity. With all of our current facts and understanding, there is no way of telling whether the word was borrowed between language families or if it was sheer coincidence that they both developed on diverging paths. But enough with these uncertainties. I don't want this video to get too dry. You see, the thing about the root wed is that it has flowed down many different linguistic currents to reach the modern day. We analyzed already how it was that we get the word water from this Proto-Indo-European root wed, but let's take another case of how wed became a modern word. We start by observing what happens when wed was modified into wadske. We can see here the return of that ablaut system in that the e has changed to an o as the tense has changed. And that added suffix there of ske has changed the meaning from water into to wash. From there, the Proto-Indo-European Wadske evolves into the Proto-Germanic Watskeana. Under Grimm's law, the D of the Indo-Europeans morphs into a Germanic T as that consonant shifts. And the added suffix there of the uh, Ana in Watskana, it changes the word into the denominative form. That is to say, a verb developed from a noun. Progressing in the timeline, the T in Watskana becomes increasingly fricative as the tongue skips over to the smoother sound of the S, similar to what we saw earlier, resulting in the devolution to just Watskana. In fact, from here, this word will be steadily chipped away at as it is streamlined and simplified over countless generations as these Germanic languages develop a separate identity. Wascana comes to Old English as Wascan. This is the first of these steps that we have direct literary evidence of. This becomes Middle English Washen, coexisting with Washen, until finally, as we approach Modern English, all that we're left with is Wash. Let's back out to Wed again. Another evolution of the root wed saw it modified to widos. That suffix there serves to make it an adjective. And of course, the adjective of water would be something that's wet or aquatic. In the eventual language split, the Proto-Germanic counterpart of this is wetas. Now, Grimm's law explains that shift from a D 
to a T, but the altered suffix is a case of Werner's law. Oh, a new law. It was created mainly to supplement Grimm's law. Werner's law explains slightly irregular consonant shifts in the Germanic languages, such as the Proto-Indo-European S here becoming a Z. Werner's law is considerably less common than Grimm's law, but it fills in one of the major holes in it. As you have noticed here, that Indo-European S becomes a Z. But if you do the same test we did with D and T, you'll see that S, S is voiceless, but Z, Z is voiced, which is the opposite of the process normally described by Grimm's law as we switch consonants between Indo-European languages and Germanic languages. Werner's law then explains this, that this is due to the stress placed on the previous syllable in the Germanic word, and thus, witas. But from this Proto-Germanic, it would enter Old English as wet. You see, as English developed, it often simplified endings and cut out different forms. In fact, wetas also had its denominative form of wetajana. If you remember that same ana, uh, suffix from wash. And wetajana would enter Old English as wetan, uh, essentially cutting out that final a, just like in washen. In fact, these two words would face the same fate as wash, as their endings were cut away at until they simplified both down to just wet. Through this comparative analysis and studying how these languages develop, you can see how just the same root of wed became the English words of water, wash, and wet. Now, if you find those connections fascinating like I do, you're really going to love the rest of this video. Because so far, we've taken all of these words that have gone directly to English. They've gone from Proto-Indo-European to Proto-Germanic to English. But there are a good dozen other Indo-European language families beyond Germanic, and a surprising amount of their words connected to a wed have wound up in English. For example, if we return to the Proto-Indo-European Wedor, the collective form of water, it would become the Proto-Balto-Slavic word Wando, also meaning water. Proto-Balto-Slavic, as suggested by its name, would furthermore split into the Proto-Baltic languages and the Proto-Slavic languages. As it entered Proto-Slavic, the W was lost and replaced with a V in a consonant shift, while, due to what's called Slavic palatalization, the vowel A in Wando shifted to O. Thus, to make this long story short, we get the Proto-Slavic word Voda. And this would become, with only very minor local changes, the word for water in all Slavic languages. This is just an interesting thing to note because it shows this just similarity across things. Even though you wouldn't think of Russian or English having much in common, you can tell unmistakably the similarity between the fact that the Russian word for water is voda. Nevertheless, it is not voda we're interested in right now, but in its diminutive form. Now, diminutive forms is one of those many things that English was just never bothered with for whatever reason. It is when you alter a word, typically by adding a suffix, to essentially say, this is small and I love it. The example of a diminutive that I would most expect English listeners to be familiar with would be the Spanish case, such as abuela y abuelita. But, back to the point. How do you make a diminutive out of voda? Well, in the Slavic case, you add a K into the word, making voda, vodka. Na zdrovia. All right, another interesting case study emerges from the Proto-Indo-European udens, which is the oblique case 
of water. Now, udens is in the zero grade ablaut form of wed. <laughs> and stick with me here because this is a bit strange to explain. So you recall on the ablaut, you switch vowels out. For instance, if I was to switch out the E for an O, like in the case of Wolder, that would be an O grade ablaut. I put in an O. This is a zero grade ablaut. Instead of switching vowels, the starting sound of that word is removed. So this would change here from wed to ut, because you have to have some sort of vowel, and the rest is added on for grammatical purposes. But udens will be picked up and changed into the Proto-Celtic word of udenskaios, which would then become the Irish word whiskey and the Scottish Gaelic whiskey, both meaning water. Later, those two Celtic languages were inspired by the Latin phrase for alcohol due to a contact with the Romans. Now, the Latins called alcohol aquavite, which translates to water of life. So, the Irish and Gaels translated that phrase, water of life, into their own languages, becoming whiskebetha and whiskebetha, now meaning alcohol. These terms will be, ultimately, anglicized into whiskey. Modern English contains two wed-based loanwords from Greek. The Proto-Indo-European water became the Greek hudor, which in ancient Greece meant water, sweat, or even time. Now, time is the most interesting of these translations, and it's due to the fact that the ancient Greeks would often use water clocks. So, you wouldn't be asking someone what time it was, you'd be saying, hey Xenophon, what's the water at? When this is used as a prefix, uh, that Greek root is modified to hydro. And you can see here that it's, it's typical in Greek for the Proto-Indo-European W to be replaced by hi, which, in fact, occurs in this next example as well. Because the zero-grade ablaut of the Proto-Indo-European widos, now you'll remember widos being their word for wet, and the zero grade ablaut being when that first starting sound is shuffled off. Well, when you put those together here, the zero grade ablaut of widos is udros. In this context, it's more aligned with the term aquatic rather than wet, but it'll wind up referring to water animals by the time of the Indo-European migrations into Greece. So, the Greek word is hydros, coming again from udros, coming from widos. And hydros meant water animal or water serpent. Now, both of these Greek words we've discussed will be borrowed and anglicized. The first word, that suffix for water, hydro, will become the English hydro. And hydros, due to its mythical counterpart, will turn from just meaning any water serpent into the great beast Hydra of myth and legend. It's these sorts of finds that I find really revealing and just fascinating about how we interact with the world and languages. I mean, when you're learning about any word with hydro in it, from hydraulic to hydrogen, it'll be said that that's, oh, that's the Greek root for water. But that's only telling part of the story. Because water and hydro are cut from the same cloth. It's more like two rivers from the same source reconverging later on when these Greek root words are borrowed back into English. And the hydra is just another interesting example of this, especially to me at least, because I can remember as a young child first reading about Hercules slaying the hydra and being quite confused as to, well, why is it called a hydra? What does it have to do with the Greek word for water? Well, over a decade later, I have my answer, I suppose. It comes from their word for water serpents. A shockingly different result emerges when we trace udros into English. 
The word enters Proto-Germanic as utras, and the changes there are those described by Grimm's and Werner's law. The D changes to T, and the S changes to Z following that stressed syllable. Proto-West Germanic, a small stepping stone between Proto-Germanic and English, begins the simplification process. And while some forms of the word still appears as atras, the usual form of the word is otter. And well, that's the fascinating thing. From the very same root, English gained both the fearsome, dreadful hydra and the cute, friendly otter. The English word for winter is anglicized from Proto-Germanic wintras, and that word is believed to derive from a nasalized root of the Indo-European root, wed to wand. This was subsequently put through the processes observed by Grimm and Werner, and this derivation shows a curious insight into the life of the language's original speakers. To them, winter was simply the wet season. The Romance languages have so far been ignored due to their intriguing split from the rest of the Indo-European language families. Now, the Romance languages include such languages as French, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, and Romanian, to name the most prominent ones, and Latin is the parent of all these languages. But the Latin word for water is aqua. Despite Latin being an Indo-European language, aqua is unrelated to wed. I mean, to understand this, the root wed, we believe sort of represented a more elemental concept of water. On the other hand, the Indo-Europeans had the less common root of hep and its conjugation hequa, which denoted the concept of a body of water. Now Latin derived aqua from that latter root, aqua. You can see how that could become aqua, and it passed that quirk onto its descendants. Nevertheless, examples of wed can still be found in Latin, such as onda, which is the Latin word for wave. Now, Latin predominantly uses aqua-derived words for water-related concepts, so etymologists have several theories on how unda, a wed-derived word, entered the language. The connection is considered certain that unda is derived originally from wed. The question is really how, because it's a very distinct part of Latin and its descendants that they took that road not traveled of relying on their main uh, water word coming from equa instead of wed and water. To list some more prominent propositions on how unda entered Latin, there is the case that states that it is another nasalized form of wed or water, and that becomes unda into Latin. Or another uh, prominent theory posits that it came from the Greeks. If you recall back to Hudor, uh, from the Greek section, this posits that that was morphed and adopted by the Romans and turned into unda, saying that it, it was borrowed by the Latins from another Indo-European language family because the Latin language did not use wed very often. Another similar theory puts that it came from the more close by culture of the Umbrians of northern Italy, and their word for water before being assimilated into the Romans was uter, which is derived from water, so on back to wed, and it's believed then that it was borrowed from them, this word unda. It's an interesting case because it can show what we can still learn at or guess about about cultures even by looking at what they speak and what people around them spoke and we can guess at how this influenced him here it seems likely that the latin language and its development was influenced by cultures it came in contact with and some of their words were adopted you could compare it as to how later on Romans would do the same with many local gods and cultures. But theorizing aside, 
Unda itself, why are we talking about it? Well, once in Latin, Unda, much like many words in Latin, became overcomplicated quickly, as it had tons of prefixes tacked on to make different sort of phrases and meanings, such as inunda, abunda, redunda, superunda, or just still unda. And from there, all of these different phrases would face the complex whims of Latin conjugation and grammar, as well as a double loan, as they moved first from Latin to French, and then from French to English following that interesting pattern of being loaned from language to language. This mainly serves to explain the slight spelling differences and ending irregularities in the different words I'm about to tell you about, just because they have been through a travel. But still, take the first three. You can still clearly see that they're based on unda, in fact it's still in the middle of the word. And English receives inundate, abundant, and redundant. If you'd like two more that don't quite share that rhythm, how about surround and undulate? Now, all of these possessed more metaphorical meanings in Latin, at least more colloquial. For instance, redundant, redundare, meant flow again. Abundare, abundant, to flow heavily. Inundare, to overflow, in a sense. Uh, surround comes from superandare. It was cut down a bit there, but of course, water surrounds. And undulate is the simplest of them all. When you uh, undulate, you move back and forth, like a wave coming in and out. You see, all these words, their ties to waves and water iconography, are lost without knowing these roots. Studying our own knowledge is a fruitful venture. By questioning that which is certain, we can learn much more about the connections that make up our world. The Indo-Europeans split up into separate cultural groups, and their languages diversified with them. The languages split again and again within their families, until one language became hundreds. They are unified with the common root, from which they draw the words that make them different. Web was the Proto-Indo-European concept of the elemental form of water. Now it's used globally in hundreds of words across hundreds of languages by billions of speakers. Studying that process forces us to reconsider connections. The changes to the word flow logically from one step to the next, even if the linguistics behind them can become complex. While the word and its idea are reimagined countless times, it still leaves a trace to follow upstream. Understanding how these words change and connect means understanding how languages arise. <laughs>